Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Untamed Intimacy. <laughs> if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see that we have this really cool virtual background on. <laughs> and if you're tuning in, again, also welcome back. Today we're going to be doing a really deep dive into the six must-have components of a relationship that has untamed intimacy or that has cultivated untamed intimacy. So, so you can think of this as the six key pillars, the key pillars that support your relationship, that hold up your relationship. Because if any of these six pillars are missing or they're weak, then the relationship gets a little wobbly. It gets a little, let's say, susceptible to mm, crashing word. and burning. Great word. Susceptible. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to do a high level overview first, and then we're going to dive into each area and we're going to give examples from our relationship because I don't know about you all, but we have been riding the waves of this time in our relationship. And our relationship has seen moments where these six components are present and moments where they are nowhere to be found. So know that you're not alone. So here's a, a brief overview of these six components. Number one is appreciation. Number two, safety. Number three, empathy. Number four is cooperation. Number five is respect. And number six is boundaries. Awesome. Okay. So let's start with appreciation. This is something that, you know, across all the texts that I've ever read on relationships, all of the studies I've done, appreciation is almost always mentioned as a key component to creating untamed intimacy, to creating intimacy in general, um, especially for those where words of affirmation is a love language, appreciation and showing appreciation through various acts of love and affection really helps to create a foundation and an environment for love and connection. We all wanna be appreciated. Everything in the universe actually wants to be appreciated. And something that we've seen in a lot of couples um, that we work with, that we've observed, is that this is something that is, again, susceptible to dissipate. So what happens is, as we get used to someone or something, then, you know, the magic of that initial euphoria wears off. And our minds are actually trained to look for something that's new and different. It's how we evolve to survive. It's how we were able to sort of, you know, spot predators in the wild. It's how we were able to spot the berries that we could eat. Unfortunately, what happens is that we get desensitized to anything or anyone that's there's too much of, right? So um, if your favorite food is pizza, you know, if you haven't eaten pizza in a while and someone puts a New York slice um, in front of your face and it's steaming, it's thin, it's, it looks so fresh, the cheese is falling off, <laughs> you're going to be in a really deep state of appreciation for it. Now imagine they keep bringing out pizzas and four hours later, you're on your fifth pie. Um, and for the next 10 years of your life, the only thing you can eat is pizza. It's going to lose its charm, right? It's going to be hard to appreciate the thousandth slice of pizza as much as you did the first slice. And so this happens in relationships too, right? We get used to the other. We forget their magic, right? And we naturally, our brains do this. We start focusing on their so-called flaws mm -hmm. or the things that, you know, aren't up to speed or up to par or um, the ways in which they seemingly fall short. And our brains are wired to actually look for the negative. So what happens in most relationships is that couples stop appreciating each other after a while. And, you know, you might know this as a honeymoon period. Um, and as appreciation drops, you know, both the people in the relationship, they stop feeling valued. They stop feeling, you know, deeply cherished. And that has a huge effect on removing the level of intimacy, reducing the level of intimacy. Another way appreciation wanes in a relationship is that, um, and you know, we've experienced this ourselves, 
withholding appreciation becomes a way to control the other person's behavior. Mm. So sometimes in relationships, we withhold appreciation as a way to punish the other, right? We're like, hey, you didn't do the dishes as you promised. So I'm going to withhold that appreciation. And what happens is when we use withholding appreciation as almost as a way of retaliation or uh, punishing our partner, then appreciation becomes weaponized. And weaponized appreciation is really challenging. So what's a workaround for this? Because as Ani mentioned, uh, oftentimes certain things can lose their charm or lose their shine over time, whether that's an iPhone or a partner. And, you know, one of the false pretenses that we're operating under is that we know everything there is to know about this person. So there couldn't be anything else to learn. There couldn't be anything new or shiny about them because we already know them. We've been dating them or married to them for 10 years or however many years. However, that's not true. There's no way we could ever fully know someone. And so are there ways to start to find places to appreciate that maybe we didn't notice before? And even asking that question can help bring our awareness to, oh, wow, I really appreciate or love the way their lips turn up when they smile, or I really love the wince they make when they're about to sneeze. And it doesn't have to be an act of service that you appreciate. It can be just a cute quirk or the way they pronounce a word that you find endearing. We can find appreciation in all of these tiny pockets and all the subtleties of someone. And the beautiful thing here is when we extend ourselves to find this kind of nuanced appreciation in others, it allows us to find it in ourselves and vice versa. If we can create a space for being present with this nuanced appreciation in ourselves, perhaps we like the curve of our lips or we like our handwriting something that seems trivial, then we can also apply that kind of appreciation to others. I just want to say that I really appreciate how you put toothpaste on my toothbrush every morning. So that's really sweet. I do. Yeah. So, you know, it's a lot of times Lee wakes up before me. And when I go to the bathroom in the morning to brush my teeth, um, every time that she wakes up before me, I find that the toothbrush has toothpaste on it and it's lying there waiting for me. And it's such a small gesture, but it means so much to me. So I just wanted to say that I really appreciate the little ways in which you express love. Oh, thank you, baby. And while we're on it, I really appreciate all of the time and energy that you so freely give to me to support me, whether it's support me in my emotions, support me in my business, support me you know, with a friend, I really, really appreciate that. There's, you know, no end to your generosity. Mm, I received that. Mm, Thank you. I love you. Love you too. <laughs> Shall we move to safety? Yeah. All right. Number two is safety. Oh boy. This is a big one. This is actually, I would consider this the bedrock of any relationship. And unfortunately, most people in the world don't feel safe. Now you may think that if you just have, um, shelter, if you have food to eat, if you have um, protection from the elements and predators, then you should feel safe, right? The thing is, unfortunately, most of safety these days exists at a mental, emotional, psychological level. And most people have often, um, they come to find that they've never felt safe in their life. And because they've never felt safe in their life, they don't really have access to safety in a relationship. Mm -hmm. How did this understanding develop for you? Um, okay, so I am one of those people who never knew what a foundational sense of safety was like, but I wasn't going around saying, I don't feel safe, I don't feel safe. I considered myself to be very physically safe. Um, and what I didn't recognize was that I never understood what deep emotional safety meant, partially because I, I rarely accepted my own emotional range, my own emotional states. I rejected a lot of the emotions that I was feeling that were inconvenient or um, 
you know, just challenging to feel. And so what helped us create that in our relationship is, I mean, a lot of it was repetition, repetition and you showing up and saying, it's okay, it's safe for you to feel this way. It's safe for you to have emotions. Um, I will love you no matter what. You're free to express yourself here. So let's break that down because I think for a lot of people, safety ends up being a very um, conceptual idea. Mm -hmm. So let's throw down some really practical ways in which you can explore creating safety in your relationship. So safety exists on many levels, right? So let's start with say emotional safety. Safety at an emotional level is feeling like there is space for your emotions in the relationship that your partner is willing to receive and hold space for all your expression in your emotions. And the caveat here is that, you know, you obviously don't want to lash out at your partner with your emotions. You don't want to project them. But as long as you're sharing what's real for you, what's true for you, then it becomes a really beautiful process in which you feel received. You feel welcome. You feel like all of you is allowed in your relationship and that helps us feel safe. What are other kinds of safety, Lee, that you've uh, developed into in this relationship? So emotional safety is definitely the biggest one. Um, you know, this is a, an interesting nuance, but energetic safety. Mm. So knowing that my boundaries are going to be honored, the space between you and I, where you end and I begin, there is and honoring of those boundaries. And we'll get to boundaries yeah. in just a bit, but a sense of um, my energies being honored, my time, my efforts, my my internal resources, yeah. um, that has helped me really feel a sense of energetic safety, mm. which is a little different than emotional safety. Right. Um, I would say also mental safety, like safety for your ideas, yeah. safety for your dreams, safety for your needs, safety for like, um, your experience, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't often agree, but if we can provide each other the safety that our experience, our respective experience is going to be considered and allowed, that really enables both of us to be individuals right. in a partnership. Yeah. Um, as well, so there's mental safety. I think that kind of correlates to intellectual safety. So ideas, um, particularly as it relates to business, um, some of the other, you know, ideas that we've spoken about. Uh, and, you know, I remember we had one conversation where we laid it out on the table uh, as, as it related to our finances. Yeah. So we created a sense of financial safety right. with each other. Right. Um, another juicy one here is sexual safety. Absolutely. This one, we've done a lot of work with each other, for each other. Yeah. And we've both really leaned into this and create a lot of sexual safety for ourselves and each other. Right. Um, let's throw some of those uh, dimensions. So I think a few that I can think of from our relationship is we expressed um we created a space first and then we expressed all the places we hold shame sexually, mm. all the experiences we've had that we've, we haven't told any other human being about, all the things that we've been compartmentalizing um, because we've been afraid to be judged and we expressed it to each other. And the other person who was listening held space for that and totally received us. And that allowed us to liberate a lot of sexual shame. Um, that to me stands out as you know one of the most powerful ways in which this relationship has been a transformative container right um sexual safety i think can also come in the form of really slowing things down in a definitely. sexual space definitely do you want to speak to that a little bit yeah before i i share that i want to make a note on what you just said about the activity of us having shared back and forth Something that's necessary here is a foundation of trust and the mindset that whatever the other person shares, whether it was an experience with the past partner, something that's coming up for them now, 
they are sovereign beings in that experience. So when we hold space for them, we want to remember that this their sharing has nothing to do with us, typically. And even if it does have something to do with us, this is their experience. So trying our best to hold a space so that they get to share in an unapologetic, unabashed way, and we hold a space for them. We just don't take it personally. We, we, we try to make it not about us, right? And once you get the hang of it, it's a lot easier than making something about us because I, I feel like we should do an episode, a full episode on this, but yeah. You know, taking things personally in a relationship is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for endless suffering. And, you know, that usually ends up um, being the thing that creates conflict most often in relationships. And after a lot of conflict, most relationships don't really survive. So learning how to really hold space for the other is really a masterclass in not taking something personally. So if your partner is sharing a sexual experience long before you guys ever had met, you know, you can imagine that that has nothing to do with you. That said, it might bring up some feelings inside you. So when it comes to safety, like we can only create safety for the other if we can create safety for ourselves. Mm. So that's, you know, one of the ways in which a relationship is really um, a transform a transformational experience, right, for both people, because to be able to give the other person that sense of safety, we have to be able to give it to ourselves. To appreciate the other, we have to be able to appreciate ourselves. To respect the other, we have to be able to respect ourselves. And so in that act of giving and providing, we grow mm. and we get filled with that energy. Yeah, so let's wrap up safety with the concept of slowing down. Yeah. Slowing way down. So for many people, myself included, for most of my years of sexual experience, I got through not feeling safe in a sexual experience by speeding it up, which is often what we do, whether we're in a sexual scenario or not. We often find ourselves living in the future, trying to get to the next thing, trying to reach the goal, get to the outcome, or we find ourselves living in the past, which is reliving the glory days or punishing ourselves for something that's already happened. In a sexual scenario, we're finding in our experience and in the clients that we've worked with that one of the things that provides the most safety is presence. And in presence, we can really slow things down. We don't have to rush to the finish line and we operate with the idea that there is no end goal in mind necessarily. Now, in that slowing things down, it may be a ripe place for emotions to come up. Awkwardness may come up because maybe we haven't slowed down that much before. Maybe we haven't really felt into those juicy, delicious pockets of space when we slow something down. And, and sometimes that can feel scary. And when we slow down, when we learn to breathe, when we learn to be there in the moment with ourselves and with our partner, that opens up a beautiful space for intimacy and connection. And, you know, something you shared with me once is what is the, what is one definition for intimacy? It's being in the same place at the same time. So not just two bodies being here at the same time, rubbing up against each other, but being in the same mental, energetic, emotional space at the same time, that's intimacy. Beautiful. And if this is something you want to dig into, I was interviewed for a magazine article in Mel Magazine. Just go to my profile. There's a link in my bio and you can hop in there and check out the article. It really talks about how to bring presence um, and stop mind wandering and going other places during sex. It'll be a really worthwhile read. Great article, by the way. <laughs> Should we move to empathy? Let's move on to empathy. Oh, man, this is uh, this is big right? Empathy is one of the cornerstones of any level of intimacy. Because when we can access empathy for ourselves and our partner, we feel really heard, we feel really seen, we see really felt, we feel understood. And in any relationship, feeling understood by the other, feeling the compassion of the other, feeling the compassionate, loving kindness gaze of the other, is really, really, really key to build that safety that we just talked about. 
Yeah, you know, I think of all the times when you've extended empathy to me, when especially when I did not have empathy for myself. Can you describe that? Because let's give some, again, empathy is one of those things that people understand conceptually. Right. But what have I done to demonstrate empathy that really stood out to you? Uh, so many, many times we've been in conversations where we're talking about some of my tendencies, maybe defensiveness or anger. And I remember having many conversations where you'd stop and you'd say, you know, well, it, it makes sense why you would feel defensive. This is what you saw growing up. This is what you saw displayed as a behavior in your mother and you took that on. So can we just pause for a moment and acknowledge that, you know, this isn't yours and we can, you know, of course you can behave differently and this is what you know. And so experiencing your empathy in that moment when I was in deep judgment for how I was showing up, whether I showed you the deep judgment or not, really caught me in my tracks. And I, I remember in those instances thinking, oh my God, wow, I, I didn't think that. I, I can't believe he is feeling hurt and also empathizing with me and what must have been a really hard experience for me growing up. Yeah, so in this example, you can think of empathy as the opposite of judgment because a great place to exercise empathy and test our levels of empathy is when there's wounding. You know, someone said, our partner says something or does something that, you know, makes us feel hurt. The key thing there is to realize, to have empathy, that they're not making us hurt, right? They're doing what they're doing and we're choosing to be triggered by it. We're choosing to respond with pain. We're, it, it's bringing something up from our past. And when we can see our partners as just hurt little kids, we can see that, you know, hurt people hurt people and they have their own wounding, they have their own trauma and they have their own experiences that are causing them to act in this way. It's not really about us. It allows us space where we can just feel their pain right? Not react to their pain, not judge their pain, not judge and lash out and punish them, but just open our heart even more, actually, when our heart wants to close, to lean in when we really want to lean away, when we want to push away. And when we do that, we allow a space to open up where we feel them. And when we feel them in that way, we feel their pain. The result is this sense of empathy, this sense of compassion, this sense of, hey, I see you. I see what you're going through. I see what you must have went through for you to show up in this way right now. And I'm not making this about me, right? Let's just be with your pain. Well said. You have shown me so much about empathy and I'm so mm -hmm. grateful for that. <laughs> okay. And cooperation? Yeah, and you've shown me a lot about cooperation. So, <laughs> you know, let's let's talk about cooperation. Let's talk about cooperation. So this is, you know, in its most basic sense, the idea of teamwork, partnership. When someone is our partner, we partner together to build a relationship, to create intimacy. And this is something you've taught me so much about, but it's especially in moments of challenge and conflict and tension, can it be you and me versus the thing, the issue at hand, instead of you versus me? Oftentimes, when tensions are really high, it can be easy to fall into you versus me, you did this, you didn't do enough of this, the finger pointing and the blaming. Cooperation completely turns that on its head. So we're looking here for support, supportive communication, the desire and the intention to work together on something toward a shared vision, a shared goal, a shared outcome, um, and being able to share in ideas and build something cooperatively together. Yeah, and this is, you can think of this as a filter, right? Do we see our relationship as, you know, me relating with this other person, or is it us relating with the world around us? And when we shift our orientation to seeing our partner as our teammate, then you might, you might still lapse and there might still be times where, you know, you don't feel cooperative and you 
or throwing grenades over the fence, but more often you're able to bring in the sense of, hey, like this conflict that's coming up, this problem that we're facing, this challenge, this you know, anxiety about money or work or you know, kids or whatever it is, it's you and I versus all of this, right? Let's open up to each other and let's join forces, right? And let's be vulnerable. So the key distinction here is that what does lack of cooperation looks like? It's closing up the vulnerability. It's closing up the heart, right? It's shutting down to our partner. And, and that's the best case. The worst case is, you know, you lash out, you project. And so what does cooperation looks like? It's leaning into the vulnerability. Hey, I feel really triggered right now. I feel so triggered. I feel like a lot of my, you know, childhood stuff is coming up because, you know, I'm, I, my experience right now is that it's just like when my dad used to scream at me when I didn't do something perfectly. And it's really causing me to feel anxious. It's really causing me to feel, you know, hurt and angry. And I would really love your help to get through this. And the test is, can I do this when my partner is the one who's triggering me, when my partner mm. is the one who's basically acting like my dad, right? And that's the test. Can I be vulnerable? Can I open up when it's the hardest to open up? Because if I can do that and my partner can do that, then we can unite. We can be unified. We can join forces. We can be in a union in service to our goals and dreams, right? We can be a team that works through our challenges, our conflicts, our issues. And what does this sound like in practice? So cooperation might sound like, hey, can you help me with this? I, I'm really struggling with something. Or, you know, hey, would you mind supporting me in something? Or, hey, do you need help with anything? I'd love to help you. I've got five minutes to spare right now. How's your project coming along? Or, hey, you know, I see that we're both feeling really triggered right now. Can we step away for five minutes and come back so we can work together on resolving this conflict? Can you throw in the team med one too? Because that's been really helpful for us. Oh, great. That's a great idea. So something that Ani and I came up with um, as a way to create neutral, non-triggering language when something doesn't feel good for one of us is saying something like, hey, this doesn't feel like something a teammate would do. Or, hey, I don't feel like I'm being supported by my teammate right now versus. Why don't you go fuck yourself? Yeah, which I've said many times. <laughs> um, so the neutral language, if, if he says to me, hey, you know what? That doesn't feel like something a teammate does. It immediately clues me in and I'm like, oh, okay. He's feeling, he's feeling unappreciated or unsupported or something right now. This is a really neutral way for me to receive that information without getting triggered so that I can say, you know what, I'm sorry about that. Let's let's talk it out. And inside that statement is um, the lack of, let's say, vindictive, finger pointy language. Mm. So I'm not saying something about her. I'm just, I'm talking about the language. I'm talking about the interaction. I'm talking about the communication. I'm saying, hey, this is not something a teammate would do right? And that opens up a space where, because there's room for her to not be triggered by what I'm saying, which would compound the problem, but it creates a space where she can think, oh yeah, you know what? It's, that's true. I'm not really acting like a teammate. Like what would a teammate act like? And she can melt a little bit. She can soften. She can say, hey, I see you're really hurting. Like, how can I help? Mm -hmm. Nice. Beautiful. Okay. Respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Respect, bro. Find out what it means to me. I don't know the reference. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. Oh my gosh, you don't know the reference. Wow. I'm sorry, everyone. Aretha Franklin. <sighs> I'm sorry. I'll, I'll play it for you Lyrics. after. Okay. Moving on. Respect. This is a huge, huge, huge component of creating untamed intimacy. So... When we're looking at respect, I mean, respect comes in so many forms. Respect for the other person's experience. Respect for the other person's experience, even if it is not our experience. Respect for the other person's thoughts, perspectives, beliefs. 
even if they're not our thoughts, perspectives, or beliefs. Respect for the other person's space, like physical space, mental space, emotional space. Even if we want to be all up in their space at that very moment. Respect for what they want to do right now or with their time in general. Even if we want to do something different. Respect for their preferences and their choices, what, you know, what they feel like um, spending their money on, what they want to do for fun, what they want to do with their weekends. Even if our preferences and choices are a little different. So if we can operate in that space of mutual respect, right? I respect you, you respect me. It completely changes the complexion, the texture of the relationship. Because rather than um, us undermining the other person's choices and beliefs and space and all these things, which let's face it, that's going to compromise safety, which is one of the key pillars. What happens is that the other person feels really appreciated. They feel really valued. They feel really considered. They feel like their experience, their choices, their preferences, their thoughts, everything is being taken into account. And that changes how they show up in the relationship and to the partnership. And this, you know, this opens a door to really great communication as well, because there, if there is a difference in values, in perceptions, in beliefs, it opens the door to have a conversation about how to align on those things, or if some of those values are non-negotiables. Right. And the key is we don't have to agree on everything. In fact, it's good if we don't, because if we do, most likely 99% of the time, that's codependence. So in our relationship, Lee likes watching TV. She likes watching TV shows as a way to zone out. And in my, like, I don't do that, right? I, it's not something that I do. It's not something I, I mean, I enjoy it. But to be honest, if I start Game of Thrones, you're not going to see me for weeks, <laughs> right? It, that's most likely what's going to happen. So I just stay away, right? I don't get into shows. I don't, I don't watch movies much and that's okay for me but I also have to respect that that's what she chooses to do now if I berate her or I judge her or I label her or I make her feel guilty or bad for doing what she wants to do by measuring her against my beliefs and my perceptions and my you know experience of what is good and what's not that's going to invalidate her experience that's going to be disrespectful to her and there's a, a big thing here in not only respecting preferences, but in respecting people's process. And this is a big one. Often we want to impose how we do things or see things or how we think about things or how we process emotions, the amount of time it takes us to, pro to process, the route that we take when we process, respecting someone else's different process. Ani and I process information much differently. The things we're drawn to are sometimes different. The way we conduct ourselves in our businesses is different, yet complementary, which is awesome. And we've learned over time and with, you know, enough disagreement to honor and respect each other's process. Beautiful. Which brings us to the last one. Okay. The Ar last one. Arguably boundaries. Boundaries. But probably the most important one. Along Actually, with safety and along respect with... and empathy and cooperation and appreciation. Yeah, I feel like it's hard to pick. <laughs> Boundaries are near and dear to my heart because I didn't have them when I was growing up. So little blast from the past historical lesson about Ani. I grew up um, to, I'm an only child and it was me, my mom and my dad. And for I think the first like eight, nine years, eight years of my life, it was just me and the two of them in one room because we, you know, rent a room in someone's house. Uh, my parent, like my dad worked three jobs. My mom worked a job and, you know, she'd wake up at 4 a.m. and like make food for us and like go to work. Um, and I was, since I was four years old, I was a latchkey kid. So I would come back, I'd hang out there. Now this room, just to give you a visual, three fourths of the room was the bed, right? It wasn't a big room. And then there was um, a dresser and there was a fridge and on top of the dresser, there was a 10 inch black and white TV. It was red in color, I remember that. And there's not much else, there's not much room out there. And that that's basically all we owned. And we'd sleep in the bed together. And 
you know, for most of my life, especially when I was growing up, which is when our subconscious formed, there were no boundaries. We were, li- we were literally in the same space and it wasn't just physical. There were no boundaries emotionally. There were no boundaries mentally. Uh, there were no, they, they, were, they didn't really respect my choices and what I wanted to do. I wasn't allowed to be an individual. So I grew up really without boundaries and what they considered boundaries were rules that were imposed on me on how I should behave and shouldn't behave, where I should go and where I shouldn't go. And that's not really a boundary in, in the strictest sense. That's the imposition of one person's belief system on another, right? That's control. So I didn't really have an experience or any sense of what the fuck boundaries are and how to actually communicate them and how to use them to make myself feel safe. Yeah, thank you for sharing that story. I love hearing about your Mm -hmm. life. So boundaries are, you know, a huge thing in understanding where we end and where someone else begins. It's huge in our self-expression, our sense of freedom, our sense of sovereignty, our sense of personal identity. And oftentimes they're very challenging for people to understand and create because we weren't modeled a sense of healthy boundaries or expression of needs. So I'm, I'm doing a lot of work in this area and I'll actually be hosting a workshop on this, so stay tuned. Um, but boundaries are creating the environment and the components that allow us to feel safe and supported in any given moment. So perhaps that's taking some extra time for something. Perhaps that's um, having a boundary around some of our preferences and what we choose to do with our time. I would say that you're one of the most gifted teachers in terms of boundaries. Thank you. I've learned so much from you about boundaries. Um, I would love for you to drop like three things, like three Hmm. things that people must understand about boundaries, because, you know, this is something that I'm still learning. I'm still growing. You know, the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And let me jump you off by saying that the reason why boundaries are so important is so that we can be and feel like individuals within a relationship. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're just this mangled, fused little blob, right? Where neither person feels like an individual. And when both, when two people in a relationship don't feel like individuals, that relationship isn't going to last very long or be very satisfying. Right. So with boundaries, um, a lot of the common misconceptions, and these aren't always conscious thoughts, but are typically subconscious, are if I create boundaries, then I will lose love, I will lose affection, I'll lose connection. So a lot of the reasons why people don't create boundaries is because there is a fear of loss of love, connection, or approval. And that can be in any relationship, whether it's a professional relationship, a familial relationship, or a romantic relationship. So... Um, You know, one of the things that I talk to many women about in creating boundaries is what beliefs are you currently holding that keep you from creating boundaries? Ooh, this is a good one. So that's, you know, the first thing to explore is what, what keeps us from creating boundaries in the first place and getting really honest about that inquiry. The second one is a lot of people don't know where their boundaries are because they haven't been taught how to create boundaries. So how do we even identify boundaries? Well, sometimes it turns out that we identify boundaries once they're crossed and that's okay. There, I've, I've seen a lot of people with different dialogues around boundaries being crossed, whether that's, I can't believe I did it again. I'm never gonna learn. It didn't feel good. That person's, that person's an asshole. So we either turn the anger and confusion and frustration inward at ourselves or we project it out at others. But there's a way to eliminate all of that in understanding where our boundaries are. So one activity that I walk some of my clients through is first identifying what your values are. So if you value uh, quality time, based on that value, what is a need that you have? So if I value quality time, I might have a need to spend one-on-one undistracted time with Ani. Now, if that is a need of mine, then what is a boundary I can put in place to make sure that that need for one-on-one undistracted time gets met? Maybe it's that we have a date night once a week where there's no technology. And so now my need for 
one-on-one -on -one time is met because I have a value of quality time. So that's one way to understand what your boundaries are. And, um, you know, starting to get familiar with how to communicate when a boundary has been crossed is another powerful tool to add to your tool belt. Um, I borrow on this format. I've kind of adapted the format from nonviolent communication, but it's very simple. My boundary was crossed when I feel, fill in the emotion, my need for blank was unmet, and my request is that blank. So my boundary was crossed when you touched my upper thigh without my permission. I feel anxious and aggravated. My need for consideration and space was unmet. My request is that you ask for my permission before touching me. Is that something we can agree to? Very simple, very clear. You still get to own your emotions, but you get to take the blaming and finger pointing out of it. Mic drop. Bam. That was brilliant. And then I disappear. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant characterization of boundaries. Because it's not just important to understand boundaries, but also communicate them, you know, in a way that the other person can receive it. Right. Because ultimately we want to receive respect from them. So if they get triggered, if they feel like, you know, we're blaming them or judging them or lashing out at them, they're not going to be able to receive the communication and then in the future honor our boundaries so this is really a way to get what we want yeah it's good stuff all right so to wrap it up the six key components of creating untamed intimacy are account well appreciation appreciation safety mm -hmm. empathy cooperation respect and boundaries um Okay, so we have so many exciting things coming up that we want to share. Uh, workshop on boundaries. So go ahead and visit my profile at Linoto underscore on Instagram for more information on that. And Ani is going to be hosting a workshop soon too. It's going to be around freeing ourselves from emotional suffering like stress and anxiety and worry. So check out my page and hit follow or whatever kids do these days. And uh, as soon as it's live, I'll share that with you. We're so happy to be having this conversation with you because we really feel as a couple doing this kind of work that these conversations really, really help make relationships more conflict-free and intimacy-rich. And that's really our mission here with the Untamed Intimacy podcast and brand. And um, we love being real with you. We, we love sharing ourselves with you in the hope that you know, even if one of these things resonate and it helps you create untamed intimacy in your relationship, the world is going to be a better place. Uh -huh. We love you and we'll catch you soon.